Coming to you live from our houses in Los Angeles, California, it's Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone, your comedy field guide to life. Tonight, the dictionary, words, a glimmerfree of delights, and so useful these days. What is the difference between a layoff and a furlough? What is the difference between a respirator and a ventilator? Between an epidemic and a pandemic? The dictionary can tell you. Joining us tonight is Merriam-Webster Dictionary Senior Editor Emily Brewster. She'll give us the word on dictionaries. Plus, Google autofill. You know that annoying auto response that fills in the rest of your sentence in an email? Like you type in, that's coming up, and the suggested autofill says, on this week's show, cue the music out. I'm Adam Felber, the man you can find in a dictionary under Adam Felber, noun, co-host of podcast who relentlessly strives to keep conversations on topic. To Felber is to steer a discussion back on the fucking tracks. And now, here's the woman the dictionary defines as Paula Poundstone, noun, podcast co-host to Revels in Free Association. To Poundstone is to respond to a question about American tax policy by making a balloon animal. Please welcome the synonym for conversational chaos, Paula Poundstone! Thank you so much! <laughs> hey, you guys! Wow, welcome, I'm Paula. So uh, well, uh, thank you. I'm so glad we could all make the technology work so that <laughs> we could each be. I'm in my bedroom slash office that has no bed. Okay. And uh, Adam, where are you? I'm in uh, Valley Village, California, in my bedroom as well. Although I've been told that my voice has been sounding a little boomy lately on these uh, remote podcasts. So I'm trying not to boom tonight. All right. Good luck. Good luck with that. Uh, right. Bonnie, I assume... You're in a RV. Uh. <laughs> I'm actually in my bedroom, away from what you call them last week, Pop and Crinkle. Oh no, uh, Crackle and Pop, your dogs. Oh, Crackle and Pop. I'm on my bed, and I've got a cup of coffee standing by. Okay, now that's oh, actually a nice. detail we didn't need, but it's good to know. Um, and Tony. <laughs> Tony, you need a hole? Where are you? Tony, what? You Tony's on a cruise ship all by herself. <laughs> Wearing How a peplos you know? on the Lido deck. Are you in a peplos on the Lido deck, Tony? Oh, yes, I am. It's beautiful outside. <laughs> Are you outside? No, I'm, I'm at my desk in my kitchen area in my studio apartment in Sherman Oaks. Oh, no, wait a minute. If you have a studio apartment, then the kitchen area is the same as your office, is it not? It is the same. Yeah. You just retitle it depending on what you're using it for, but <laughs> you're in your all purpose space. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I've been staying busy. Well, you know, before we get we... to that, Paula, I want to say a big welcome to tonight's house band, Banjo Picker Harry Arlov. Oh, oh. fantastic. I mean, Thank our you, nobodies Harry. have really been stepping up for us in this, uh, in these dark times, providing music, you know, sight on scene from remote locations. One of our uh, nobodies um, just gave me heart surgery. Really? Uh, just here, here at my house. Uh, that, se that seems risky. <laughs> no, it was so kind. I was having trouble with the ticker, and of course, okay. it, you know, hospitals can be dicey now uh, with so the virus. So, who was and all. this? Who was this nobody? Uh, just a guy named Greg. He just came over. Uh, yeah, had... Paula, even even nowadays, I would get your heart surgeon's last name. You know what? It was so intense. Uh, I probably he probably did tell me, but I've okay. forgotten. <laughs> right. I just remember yelling, Greg, Greg. I remember that. <laughs> uh, but he all just, right. All right. He just he didn't have like a blade of any sort. He just had really long nails. And, okay. Uh, wow. That sounds really unsafe. Just no, he just poked him in there and did, okay. you know, fix the ticker. I mean, I feel fantastic. Really? You know, yeah, the irony about all this horror we're going through is I, I'm in the best shape of my life. I mean, I came through a, a heart surgery from a guy that, uh, you know, just a, a, a nobody. Uh, yeah. And I, I recovered in, I don't know, two days, maybe two days. Um, Paula, when we say heart surgery, do we mean like Greg with his nails literally opened up your chest? That just seems yeah. really unsafe. 
And if he was using nails, that means he wasn't using gloves. No, he wasn't using gloves. I'll tell you. Uh, no, he washed his hands. I watched him. I sang happy birthday while he washed his hands. It, he couldn't have been cleaner. And uh, and then it turned out there was just some, the way he described it, and I'm going to, you know, fuck up the Latin, but he said there was a lot of shit in there that was mixed up. Wow. And, uh yeah, that just, doesn't sound at all. But so while good. I've been recovering, Adam, I've been playing Monopoly uh, okay. with myself, and uh, oh, I've won. I've won like three out of four games. <laughs> who, who, who won the game that you didn't? Uh, it was a draw. It was a draw. Oh, I mean, okay. there was one where both of us were so pissed. <laughs> it was very, very competitive. Um, uh, I'm sure it was. You know, all right. Speaking of compa- you know what I hate, Adam. You know what I absolutely hate. What it's is that? Paula? When when I've been t- when I'm typing uh, an email, right? No, I think it's when you're replying. That's what it is. When okay. you're replying, and Google tells you. Okay, so you're talking about what- Gmail here. Yeah. Okay. Gmail, right? Exactly, and it gives you a response. Oh. You know what I'm talking about? Is it yes, auto yes. response? You, or... you, yeah. In fact, it gives you like three options usually at the bottom of the screen when you uh, receive an email. And I hate that too. I What? Like I couldn't think to write my own answer? I mean, it's just so no, lame. I hear, I hear you. Not, on, not only do I hate it. You know what I hate the most about it, Paula? I hate that um, often one of its suggested responses is exactly right. Well, there are times when I was going to give that response, but I'll tell right. you something. I have changed my response <laughs> so that I wasn't giving. Me too. Me too. Why give that thing the satisfaction, right? So my stockbroker, he wrote and he said, do you want to buy or sell? And the the auto thing said sell. And I wrote buy. <laughs> Oh, that's a bad idea. I just <laughs> no. That's the kind of way I've been doing. No, I just you I know what it do reminds that. me of. What I don't like, I don't like someone to give me an answer. And you know what it reminds me of? I'm gonna say something. I'm just gonna say it. I don't care who it hurts. Okay. When I was in the sixth grade, uh, wow. there was this really genius kid, uh, and her name was Jackie Toll. And this kid was like a devout Christian and a very, very serious person and an excellent student. And a couple okay. of times we were we were taking a spelling test. Right. And Jackie Toll assumed I didn't know the answer. And so really, out of what was a kindness in her heart, she sort of ooched her paper over a little bit near me. And no one in a million years would have ever guessed that she would do such a thing. Right. But she ooshed her paper so that I could see her answer because wow. she was assuming, by the way, that right. I didn't know the answer. Well, correctly, <laughs> I'm guessing. No, co- co- no, no. And this is my point. And do you know that when she did that, despite the fact that I already knew the answer, I would leave it blank. Because really? A, I didn't want to, I didn't want to put Jackie Toll at risk. I certainly didn't ask her to do that. And C, I just, I, I don't want any handouts. Okay. E- except for the stimulus money from the government. I want that. I want that as well, too. Um, and yeah. I, who, who knows when we're going to get that. Uh, before we get too far, Adam, I just want to remind everyone that we do have the 100th Caller Contest. We're continuing oh, we our are? 100th Contest. So keep the calls coming, you guys. Our 100th Caller will receive any appliance at Roger okay. Federer's appliance store free. Not his store. And it, it is. It's Roger Federer. It's called Federer. Uh, no, it's Roger Federer. That, I've seen Federer. him over there, Adam. Okay. I've seen no. him. I've talked to him. <laughs> I, that's how my dog. That's how my god. My dog got the job as the ball dog at Wimbledon. Is I've because watched, Roger. F- I've watched tennis matches. Far across the world, featuring Roger Federer, and he's and he can't be there and in North Hollywood at the same time. Well, it's his store. He's not there every minute. You, okay. You know. Um, all right. So, anything you want from Roger Federer's appliance store? Any uh-huh. appliance free? Hundredth caller and a chance. And this is making people crazy. A chance to hang out with Adam after the game. Uh, okay. So, that's something. 
that a lot of people are really, really excited about. I want to remind all our listeners that you have the option of not calling. Oh, and uh, don't do that. And uh, the other thing <laughs> that I am so excited about, I, I, I almost I almost forgot for a second. I don't know okay. how I could forget this. Okay. I have, Adam, an auction item for today. Oh, we're uh, auctioning enough, off another item. Yeah, we are. Uh, it It is so exciting. It's killing me, not just to hold on to it. Um, well, after what we auctioned off two shows ago, which was uh, uh, that Chisholm Trail mix, right? Yes, it was a trail mix from the Chisholm Trail that was owned by uh, Shirley Chisholm. It was from right. the Shirley Chisholm Trail. Okay. Um well, so this is also really exciting and also um, belong to an inspirational person in our history. Um, it is a lint ball. A lint it's, ball. Yeah, it's oval shaped. It's about, I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't know, three inches around. It's about, if it's shaped it's sort of like an egg it's about uh, four inches tall and about three inches wide. Uh, okay. It's a big, fluffy lint ball. And I want to thank the United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 324 website for teaching me about the person this valuable lint ball belonged to. This <laughs> belonged to self-described lint head, Crystal Lee Sutton, who helped organize the workers at J.P. Stevens Textiles Mills the nation's second largest textile manufacturer, and she was, in fact, the inspiration for the movie Norma Ray. And I have her <laughs> lint ball. Okay. Uh, um, and so many, so many know, questions pop to mind about that. But uh, you can't being, bid. If that was your question, you can't no, bid. You're no, too, I, I don't want to bid. Conflict, a conflict of interest. Sure. Uh, she was very, very proud, Linthead. And, uh, oh my God, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't believe it. There's already somebody who apparently knows the value of, of um, Crystal Lee Sutton's lint ball. Uh, J. Scott Cromie, a nobody, fantastic. You know, our nobodies are the best. Um, J. Scott has bid an initial $1,000. Thank you, J. Scott Cromie, for that bid. Uh, clearly already knows the value of the lint ball and the importance of uh, Crystal Lee Sutton. Yeah, I, that's, I don't. That's think, fantastic. I mean, to my knowledge, linthead was a was a derogatory term used to describe people who worked in textile mills. Not, it didn't mean they actually collected lint. Well, she has lint. Uh, I think from her job. Okay. Uh, she brought some home, I guess. Uh -huh. I, I mean, I can't speak to what her motivations were for doing it, but it was something okay. that she held dear. All right. And uh, and I have it, and I okay. and I okay. and I have it now. <laughs> okay, uh, Paula. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a vocabulary word today? I do, Adam. I okay. do have a word. <laughs> All right. I just um, have to what find is it? it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a word, Adam. Paula, I picture you covered head to toe in post-it notes right now. Oh my God, there's a lot of confusion going on in my room. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you, um, I mentioned to you that I've been spending a lot of the uh, time at home training my dog, Mo, and she's taken on a lot of my office assistant work, and I'll tell you. Right, because Wendell's too busy uh, making pussy pillows. Wendell is sealed off. I, I can't have contact with Wendell. I can't, you know, because we don't, because we don't know who has what. So he's totally sealed off. Um, okay. But I do have a word, Adam. All right. It's cataplexy. Cataplexy? It's a noun. I don't know that one. It's a noun. Yeah, it's a noun that means a medical condition in which strong emotion or laughter causes a person to experience sudden weakness in the muscles. Oh, so you, it, it's when you're literally weak with laughter or another emotion. Now, it says it's a medical condition. So I I was thinking it's like when you get weak with laughter. Okay. But I'm not certain um, if it's something beyond that. Okay. You know, if there's like normal 
sort of, you know, a little rubbery with laughter and cataplexy is something beyond that. I'm not certain, but here I'll use in a sentence. Uh, don't make me laugh. My cataplexy will kick in. Huh? Don't you think, don't you, th I think we'll be using that word a lot. Don't you think, uh, will we, uh, raggedy yeah. Ann used to say it to raggedy Andy. Uh, in what venue? Well, anytime they had an emotion. Oh, because they're rag dolls. <laughs> yeah, because ne <laughs> oh. exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. I would say I would say they exist in an almost eternal state of cataplexy and probably aren't that worried about it. And they both always had smiles on, so I have to assume that it was laughter. Uh, just gave them a permanent case of uh, cataplexy. Well, let's make sure the word is firmly in place in my okay. brain by okay. adding it to my vocabulary song. Wait a minute. Hold on. I got to whip out my glockenspiel. Oh, boy. Um, I can't uh, really remember the song already, Adam. Uh, uh, it's da, 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 da. Got it. This the lullaby of Broadway. <laughs> the Did you get that? The lullaby of Broadway. Fuck you, it's not the lullaby of Broadway. <laughs> this week's word is cataplexy. It's a noun that means a medical condition in which strong emotion or laughter causes a person to experience sudden weakness in the muscles. Ha ha ha, I can't budge. Last week's word was lacuna. It's a noun that means cap or... The week before that, the word was tautology. It's a noun that means saying the same thing over again in different words. Considered a fault of style. See you soon in a little while. Going back before that, we had temerity. <laughs> it's a noun that means rash or presumptuous daring. And not long ago, the word was aplomb. It's a noun that means calm self-confidence. Will I ever have that? Not a chance. Let's never forget Galima Free. It's a noun that means confused jumble or medley of things. Hodgepodge. Who's Podge? Hodgepodge. Adam doesn't think my song is replicable. 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 But I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Wait, that's not the right note. I do. I do. I do. I do. Oh my God. I don't know why every, every wow. nobody wouldn't want to be the musician on this show with that kind of quality. Yeah. And yet every nobody doesn't necessarily want to be the musician on this show. <laughs> and, yes, they and do. Even when we got together in person back in the old days before the plague, uh, very few, in fact, none of our musicians really were able to play along with your intensely replicable song. You know what? It's it's a high level. Of, yeah. yeah. I, you know, we've had we've had, you know, plenty of professional musicians and you're right. None of them could really hang with my song. That's that's exactly right. And and don't feel bad about that. You house bands, you've been fantastic. And if I <laughs> if I outstrip you a little bit in the area of music, that is nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, so, uh, you know, try to keep your egos in check, musicians who play it up. Nobody listens to Ball of Poundstone. Uh, you just have Absolutely nothing there. to be yeah. ashamed of. Nothing to be ashamed of. You know, um, coming up, lyricist Ira Gershwin wrote, If I'm a guy who doesn't seem so merry, it's just because I'm so misunderstood. When I was young, I ate a dictionary, and that did not do me a bit of good. For I've observed so many words and phrases, they drive me dizzy when I want to speak. I start explaining, but each person gazes as if I spoke in Latin or in Greek. Well, she didn't need a dictionary, but she edits one. Merriam-Webster Dictionary Senior Editor Emily Brewster is coming up when we return on Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. BetterHelp, the world's largest counseling service, has asked me to talk to you about something that's really important, which is your mental health and how to reach out and get help. You wouldn't hesitate to go to the doctor for professional care if you had a broken arm. Well, your mental health deserves the same attention. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own counselor from their network of licensed, accredited, and board-certified therapists. You can start communicating in under 24 hours, and it's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There's a 
broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network, which may not be locally available in many areas. And again, you're not limited to the nine to five of traditional therapy. You can log into your account anytime to send a message to your counselor. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions and get timely and thoughtful responses from your own personal counselor. You'll never have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room, which is my favorite thing. Instead, get therapy from the comfort of your own living room, or maybe you have an expensive patio furniture set up. Yeah. You could be there. Call from or, your yard. Or your couch or, or your bed. You don't, you don't even have to get up, for heaven's sake. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if ever needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp's mission is to provide everyone with easy, affordable, and private access to professional counseling anytime, anywhere. Get started today. And nobody listens to Paula Poundstone listeners. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Paula. That's BetterHelp.com slash Paula. On this day in unremarkable history, Galileo said, my neck hurts. Thank you. How's bad Harry Arlov? Oh, wow. It's good to have you back, Harry, even if you're not actually with us. Paula. Yeah. As you demonstrate every week, you love words, even if you can't retain them. I do. But, uh, you know, scale of one to 10, how is your vocabulary song helping you? Um, well, you have to keep in mind the challenge that it faces. Which is? Uh, trying to get me to remember something. Right, it's not really um, your strong suit, the memory It's thing. really not my strong suit, um, at which my kids played on to their destruction when they were children. They were always telling me that I said something that I had never said, you know. Clever. You said, you, you yeah. know, because I have no memory. This is the point of what I'm trying to tell you. Um, I would say you do have an extraordinary short-term memory. Like I've, I've seen like in live shows, when you start dealing with an audience member, you remember a lot of details, but I sense that it's gone by the time the show's over. Okay, during my show, my brain is a little bit like a penis. Okay. It, my, my brain fills and stands up during my show. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, it goes flaccid. So you're uh, saying that during your show, you just have a constant brain rection. That's exactly correct. But after that. Okay. But you know what? I am so excited about our guests. I, I was thinking, like, and I love all of our guests, no disrespect intended, but, you know, I, if we were to have on, like, Julie Andrews, right. I might get as excited as I am to have- Well, then let's just, let's just get to her. Let's do it. Because you love your dictionary. I do. And right here, via the magic of Zoom, we have the woman who helped write the dictionary. Emily Brewster is a lexicographer who has worked on the definitions for such common and complicated words as a uh and love. She is the senior editor of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Please welcome Emily Brewster. Emily, welcome. Hey, Emily. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Well, let's start with some basics. It's great to have you. Say it's six months ago, pre-crisis, and you go into the office. What do you do there in your dictionary office? Well, you go in quietly, really, because oh. it's a very quiet environment. That does it's, not surprise me. <laughs> it's quieter than a library. It's quieter than any library I've ever been in. It's just, it's just very, very quiet. But you know, and how you, many people are in there? Oh, on the editorial floor, there are, I don't know, about 30 people. It's small wow. staff. You would think a place of words would be brimming with conversation, overflowing with conversation. Yeah, it's it's not allowed. Why? Yeah, I'd, I'd be intimidated to talk around people who knew, who knew to contradict my every usage. <laughs> well, that's not the concern. The concern is that if you have, if you, if you are, if you are loud and making a lot of noise, that people will lose their concentration and then they will mess up a definition and then, you know, hours of work will, will perhaps be lost. Wow. That's the real concern. Okay. Oh, so it's like at every desk, they're building a house of cards. <laughs> you, you, In you, front you, of their screens, yes. Yeah, you have to hold your breath while you walk through 
for fear of knocking over someone's word and them. It's true. What if they did write the wrong? Uh, what if they did give misinformation? You'd have people. The world would come apart. <laughs> Emily, have you ever gotten a definition wrong? Well, I mean, I've I've been edited before. They go every definition gets, get, <laughs> goes through a process where a number of editors see it. So certainly um, other editors have tweaked my definitions and I have tweaked other editors' definitions. So, wow. right. you know, have I gotten it wrong? Nah, I, you know, sure. But I, I don't think a wrong definition that I've written has actually made it into a dictionary where the public might see it. Okay, because so it, it's like when you get a pair of jeans and there's an inspected by number in the pocket. So this dictionary was inspected by how many editors? How much process does it go through? Well, again, our, our staff is really about 30 people, and that includes definers, and it includes etymologists and a dating specialist. We have, What's an etymologist? The, Aren't those people, isn't that the study of bugs? No, that's, that's an entomologist. entomologist. Yes, yes. An etymologist deals with the history of a word. How did a word come to be? Now, do you have a creative department? Are there people who come up with such delightful coinages as, say, brain rection? <laughs> no, no, we leave that to the to the masses. We leave that to the speakers of the language out there. And we well, just- Well, you know what, Emily, Adam brings up a good point um, because uh, brain rection- <laughs> You sound surprised. Um, not at all. Uh, <laughs> so what will have to happen to our word brain rection for it to end up in your dictionary? Yes, because I would love to see in your dictionary brain rection, noun, a state of mental tumnescence. That's a, that's a nice definition. I really like that. And you know, the fact is that you're, the fact that that this word was coined in the presence of a lexicographer, and there are not really that many, so that's kind of a rare thing. Anyway, that that really does do some some help. It offers it some some kind of oh, some kind of early. Oh yeah, we got but, the inside track. All right, so there's so there's nepotism involved. <laughs> well, no, I mean the the word brain rection is going to languish forever unless it makes it into published edited text. So it really needs to, you know, like make it into the New York Times or Newsweek, you know, better have it be both of them, really. So the New York Times or Newsweek, or that's the only way they get that brain rection can be a word? No, but those would be important. And any kind of, you know, if it, if it appears in, in um, you know, good housekeeping, that would also help. It does, there's no one source that it needs to appear in to qualify for entry, but we have to have significant evidence of it in use in a wide variety of sources over an oh. extended period of time. I you see, so are, are nobody's there for, uh, and there are thousands of them. Now you guys have your marching orders. Use brain rection as often as possible. <laughs> exactly, um, yes. Em Emily, I don't know if you're a gambling one, what do you think the odds are of brain rection ever being used in Good Housekeeping magazine? <laughs> ah, well, you know, I, I, I can make, no, I know nothing about their editorial policies. So I can only make a prediction about what, you know, what are the chances of brain rection appearing at merriamwebster.com in our actual dictionary. And I would say that they are somewhat limited. Limit. We'll take that as a challenge, we will, Emily. <laughs> That's exactly right. I hope you realize, Emily, that we've almost found Thomas Coyne. Um, all right, here's another question for you. So are there rules for writing the dictionary? Like when you first went there, did somebody tell you, the, show you the ropes? What are the rules? Oh, yes, yes. To me, a lexicographer, you, you have to know how to do lexicography, which is the writing and editing of dictionaries. And there's no, there's, there's no, educational institution that really teaches you that because you only need about 50 people in the whole country to do the job. So oh. um, it, it just, you have to do all the job in-house. So, so a dictionary science major would be completely useless at most colleges because there just aren't any jobs out there. <laughs> that is true, yes. Okay. <laughs> but there are lots of other majors that are very useful. Actually, any kind of background is helpful if you want to be a lexicographer because there are science terms to define, there are economics terms to define, you know, there really any field can, can be beneficial and you really have to have kind of a, a passion for language and a feel for the language. That's really what you need. And then beyond that, you just need to be able to spend 
hours and hours thinking about the meaning of a particular word while the world just kind of withers around you and you just sit in solitude thinking about what this word means. So that can be, you know, not, not everybody can, can, can survive that really. So how do you decide what words go in? It's this thing about they've been used in some sort of edited written piece uh, many times over a period of time, is that correct? Yes, and those criteria are intentionally vague. Basically, what we're looking to, uh, to, to determine is whether the word is really established in the language. We don't want to put a word in that is only used by you know, two people on a podcast, for example, not to, mm -hmm. to find a point on it. But Wow. <laughs> Ouch. But, I want to point out that three people on a podcast have now used that word, and we're just getting started. Oh, yeah. I was counting myself. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, it is. It, I, I am. I'm. I'm warming to the word. I really am. You know, what? <laughs> you don't have to. It's grown exponentially already. Um, <laughs> um, so, why don't all general use dictionaries just carry the same words? I, I find I can look something up and find it in one dictionary and not find it in another, and they're both fat. They're both fat. The dictionaries. Not the word, because the word fat is in virtually every dictionary. I'm not saying I looked it up in a student pocket dictionary and it wasn't there, and yet no. it was in a big dictionary. I'm saying two dictionaries that look like they both should have everything in there and one has it and one doesn't. Why? I think there are really two possibilities for why two dictionaries would not have the same words. One is that they, uh, the dictionaries have different uh, criteria for what word qualifies for entry. And then the other is just that one dictionary is is maybe doing a better job than the other. Aha. Uh -huh. oh. Now, do you ever leave a word out of your dictionary just to spite those snobs over at the OED? No, no, no. Are and actually, sure? I should say that the, the the dictionary world is so small that it's really very collegial. Like we we lexicographers from all the different dictionaries, we know one another. It's 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 really a pretty. It's not. Yeah, but not you couldn't help getting world. in this thing about doing a better <laughs> job right there. Well, me and Paula heard that. Well, I, but I think it, it really is um, more often a matter of criteria for entry, really. The OED is an enormous dictionary. You know, the print edition is 20 volumes long. That's yeah. Oxford there, English Dictionary for people yes. out there that are like me. Sorry, the Oxford English Dictionary. And it's, um, it's quite, it aims to enter all the words that really have been used in the history of the language. And Merriam-Webster's dictionaries really don't try to do that job. Mm -hmm. We, um, right. and our, our unabridged dictionary does something kind of in between what our Merriam-Webster.com dictionary, which is very much like the print collegiate dictionary. Right. Um, our unabridged dictionary is kind of a halfway point between those. It covers a lot of you know, most of the vocabulary that's in the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, is yours the one that has the drawings in it, the line drawings? We have lots of drawings. Oh, because I was one time looking up a word and I stumbled across another word, which is my favorite way to discover a word. Um, so I was looking up something and I saw a picture that appeared to be me. <laughs> and I looked, I looked more carefully at it and it was an illustration, sadly, of the word dewlap. <laughs> oh. Which, which I used to think was called a waddle, but that's only in fowl. It's uh in humans it's a dewlap. In humans it's a dewlap. And let me tell you, my picture is in that dictionary. <laughs> I I have a regrettable dewlap. <laughs> Emily, why would you put a picture of Paula there? That's just kind of insulting. Honestly, it's cruel. Um, I'm I'm not the illustrations editor. I'm sorry. You know they could have done it without a face and without my name underneath it. Um, <laughs> now, That's a pity. I read the dictionary a fair amount, and half the words in my dictionary are names of plants, and I find they just get in the way. I skip over them. They're they're really Latiny, and I don't mean like dandelion or black-eyed Susie. I mean lepidus, fertigengi. Uh, they're technical terms. Why are so many plant technical terms, hogging space in my dictionary, as opposed to any other subject. Okay. Yeah, Emily. <laughs> what do you have to say to that? Um, um, uh, what do I have to say to Why that? Why so many plants is, is I think Paula's uh, question. Why so many plants? Well, all right, I, I don't wanna, wanna shirk responsibility. I am an editor. 
of a dictionary. I am actually not a science editor. So I am not the one who decides whether or not a plant name qualifies for entry. But I will say- Okay, so you did just shirk responsibility. <laughs> but I stand behind every one of those plant <laughs> names that are in our dictionary. All right. Damn it. <laughs> You've told me that you walk through an office working area of 30 people quietly. Why couldn't you one day, and you don't even have to shout apparently, just in a normal speaking voice, go, okay, let's cut the shit with the plant words. Enough with the plants already. Yeah. I, I like the plant words. And to be honest, the plant words appear in lots of literary contexts as well as in scientific contexts. So those oh, two bullshit. worlds of, well, you know, you look at 19th century literature and it's all sort of like, you know, dog tooth violets and, and all these obscure, I, I think, I, I, okay. Again, I'm not unhappy with dog tooth violets, but what, you know, what, what literature was it in Wuthering Heights when Heathcliff says to the girl, uh, your eyes are like Lepidus Fritigengi? No, no one, those are not used in literature. I guess I got to look that one up. Lepidus Fritigengi? Is that a Leopidus. real Lepidus. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm guessing Paula wrote that down. It's I would Lepidus just like to say, I, Lepidus I can't really spell it. I'm trying. L-E-O-P-I-D-U-S. F-E-R-D-I-G-E-N-G-I-S. Lepidus for the Genghi. What do I win? <laughs> Everything. I don't know that you win anything. <laughs> I, I would just like to say this, Paula. What plants or animals should be left out of the dictionary? I just think that if they want to put the name that we would recognize it with, fine. Throw in dandelion or, or rose or, or, you know, stargazer lily. Uh, Ger Gerber, I, I'm happy for all those. <laughs> but Lepidus Fertigengi, no. How, how do you how do you feel about the adjectives? Like 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 a like a, a nice adjective like lanuginous, which is really from the plant world. Do you know that word? No, I don't. What okay. what does it mean? It means covered with down or soft hair, downy. Like an African violet's leaves are lanuginous. Oh. It's nice, right? It sounds so lovely. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds so lovely until I realize once again it's describing me. <laughs> it, it also describes babies, right? Babies always have that that babies are very lanuginous. They are. They're not? Absolutely. Babies aren't furry. Mine were. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I gotta ask you this, Emily. Who was the father? <laughs> Uh, you know, a poet, essayist, playwright, and lexicographer Samuel Johnson wrote, lexicographer, a writer of dictionaries, a harmless drudge that busies himself in tracing the original and detailing the signification of words. To that we say, fuck you, Samuel Johnson. She's not a drudge. Stay tuned for more about words from Emily Brewster. The Cat of the Week is Archimedes from Somerville, Massachusetts. Well, Paula, I don't have to tell you that this world has gone wireless. And as far as I'm concerned, everybody needs a great pair of wireless earbuds. But before well, anybody out there goes dropping hundreds of dollars on a pair, like, say, maybe Tony Anita Hull recently did, you need to check out don't the wireless it. earbuds from Raycon. Uh, you know what? The ones that she got are at the bottom of the ocean. She lost them when she was being keel hauled. <laughs> she probably lost them. And you know why? Because the ones that she got kind of hang out of your ear, whereas the Raycon earbuds, oh. the ones I have, the uh, Everyday E25 earbuds, they're best ones yet, they don't hang out of your ear. They fit seamlessly in there. It's really a beautiful thing. And they cost about half of what other premium wireless earbuds on the market start at, and they sound amazing. Don't believe me? Did you just say seamlessly? I did. Nobody sews the earbuds into their ears. You were using the other ones incorrectly. Oh, maybe that was the problem. What I mean is they, they don't hang off your ear. There's no extensions that oh, yeah. uh, dangle onto your cheek or anything like that. Ah, oh, jeez, I hate that. See what I'm talking about? So it gives you a nice yeah. noise-isolating fit. And if you don't believe me, believe Bonnie Burns, who received a pair of Raycon E25s, and she never got to use them because her daughter stole them for dog walks, right? Uh, yeah, her daughter <laughs> walks uh, crackle and snap, her dogs. Yeah. 
Well, Bonnie will never know, but I use my E25s and I love them. They're so comfortable. They're perfect for on the go listening, for taking phone calls. Um, and they're stylish. And, you know, you've, we've talked about the company before. It was co-founded by Ray J and celebrities like, well, Cardi B, our own Cardi B and Melissa Etheridge. They're obsessed with Raycon. So pick up a pair and see what the hype is all about. It's a call to action. <laughs> <laughs> Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash Paula. That's buyraycon.com slash Paula for 15% off Raycon wireless stylish earbuds. Buyraycon.com slash Paula. We're back with lexicographer Emily Brewster, the one and only sole author of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. <laughs> uh, please no. Don't no, make no, me no, do no, it no. by myself. It's a giant room of 30 people, but they're so quiet, they'll never object. <laughs> Emily, we, we were talking about how strong your vocabulary is as a result of your work. Um, how often do you say the word thingy? I like the word thingy. I, you know, there's also like thingamabob and there are oh, yeah. variations on that, but there's nothing wrong with a word for just an imprecise, I can't think of it kind of a word. I, you know, I'm so glad to hear you say that because it used to make my father mad when I said thingy. Oh, people get so mad about so many things. Yeah, I think, I think when I used the word thingy, it was such a submission that I didn't know stuff that my father, who was a very brilliant man, it made him angry, I think, you know, wondering how I got that way. Um, uh, I, think, oh. I think he felt I was somehow an extension of him and this upset him, whatever the word for that is. Um, so you clearly do know a lot of words, right? Is it just sort of, uh, do you seek to know a lot of words or just in the course of your work, like two or three stick? Like my biology teacher in the high school, Mr. Roop, uh, he was our teacher when uh, we were doing genetics with the fruit flies. And I think when he went home at night, he had like fruit flies around his head and shit. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it was just collateral, you know, unintended consequences of his work. Is that how words are for you? The words are just flying around in your head because it was all in a day's work? Um, I wish I could actually remember all the words um, even that I define. I can define a word and then not actually remember what it means. So many of them stick, and um, but I don't, I, and I, I am one of, the, one of the editors of the Word of the Day. I'm a you know, group, a team of, of people who make the Word of the Day happen, and I've been doing that for many years. So I've learned a lot of those words. But I, you know, I think memorizing words that don't have a lot of use, that are not apt to pop up frequently in one's daily life, that's hard. Yeah, definitely. Um, let me ask you this. I have a very popular vocabulary song that I use to remember words I learned. And even so, only a small percentage of words uh, do end up sticking in my head. Uh, do, you, do you ever consider, however, using the vocabulary song? I, I, I am familiar with the vocabulary song, and I, I don't feel like it would work for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it doesn't work for anybody. <laughs> That's not true, Adam. So, Emily, what about that vocabulary song? It doesn't help you. Why not? Uh, well, it doesn't rhyme. You know, like rhyming is is a special. I mean, sometimes there are some rhymes. Yes. Yes. But it's not. It's not reliably rhymy. Right. Emily, yeah. I wish I had a thesaurus right now to think of another phrase to say to you, but I'm going to go with <laughs> "fuck you." No. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, take it as a compliment. I have been getting that about this vocabulary song for a long time. <laughs> I'll reply with odds bodikins. Ooh. I, what is that? It's a mild oath. I mean, that's all the definition it gets. It's just an obsolete mild oath. And it means God's bodykins, which means like basically God's relatives. Oh, wait. So wait, what was the word? Odds bodikins. Odds bodikins? Odds yeah. bodikins? Yep. Yep. And it's it's very similar to, and you can also say uh, the phrase, this one is actually two words. It's the it's a compound compound term, God's bodikins. So there's odds bodikins, God's bodikins, and odds bobs. And that one's hyphenated. And that one means God's body. Yikes. 
I prefer Odds Bodikins, I think. That's yeah. a good one. I'm going to use the, that a lot, I think. But the most disturbing one in this, in this family of mild oaths is Gadzooks, which you, you've heard Gadzooks before, right? Of course. But it means, it means God's hooks. And it, it comes from, you know, referring to the nails of the crucifixion. Well, um, Gadzooks was used a lot in um, Scooby Doo. And I also think in Fred Flintstone, and I wonder if either one really know the meaning of it, because it's not like Scooby-Doo to use any kind of oath. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, you know, at, at this point, it's such a mild oath. It's really lost a lot of its punch. Uh, speaking of which, is fuck in your dictionary? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, cool. and how is it defined? Uh... I, you know, I, I haven't memorized the, the definitions in the dictionary, so I'm going to look it up. Yeah, Would I'm you? guessing copulation is part of it. it well, it, you know, it's a, it's a polysemous word, a word with multiple senses. They're all, they're, they all have labels here. You know, there's a verb, there's a noun, there's, um, okay, just a verb, just a noun, so just those two. Uh, but then okay. there are all kinds of related terms like fucker, and, you know, then there, there are phrasal verbs like fuck around. And, uh-huh. Um, but at the verb, number one. You've got a whole department is, of fuck in your dictionary. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a word that a person might, might have to spend a week on or so, really. <laughs> no, probably not a week, not a week. But, you know, I, early in my lexicographical career, I, I came home from work one day and I told my husband that I'd been working on ass all day. And I didn't realize how funny that would sound <laughs> until it actually was fully out of my mouth. But it was true. I had been working on ass all day. That is a great story. <laughs> I was I used to read aloud in the schools that my kids were in. And uh, so once a week for years, I read aloud in Miss Talbot's class um, because more than one of my children had Miss Talbot. So when Allie was a student there, I was reading aloud from a book. Uh, what was it? Uh, oh, 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 Emile and the Detectives. I had found it in a store. I knew it because it was a movie that I saw. I think it was a Disney movie when I was a kid. And uh, anyway, so I'm reading the story and there's a, uh, at one point, someone calls someone a silly ass. And so I read it because there it is. <laughs> and um, when I come back the following week, Miss Talbot has the book there for me on the corner of her desk where I always picked it up. And there was a post-it note on it that said, did you read Silly Asses? Well, I had forgotten the words in the book. So I honestly, I am not <laughs> making this up. I thought it was a book that she was recommending that I get for the kids. And I, <laughs> I, looked at her and I said, no, is it good? I could get that. And my daughter told me later that she saw me talking to Miss Talbot about it. And she said, I had a look on my face of such confusion. I said, Allie, Helen Keller understood what water was before I understood what Miss Talbot was saying. <laughs> and then I looked up ass, and just as I suspected, it's donkey. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't an inappropriate phrase in any way. So, Mrs. Talbot, if you're listening, um, kiss Paula's ass. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. Um, um, Ob's Bodikins, Miss Talbot. <laughs> That's right, with a good dose of a Midsummer Night's Dream in there, right? Like you know, it's it's right. it's like yeah, it's a it's a it's a good word. It's Absolutely. really a perfectly fine word. Ob's Bodikins. <laughs> it sounds like a person's name. Um, all right, but there was a point to this. So you're working. There on wasn't. Talking about fuck. Um, <laughs> did you look it up? Yeah, I'm I'm there right now. I mean, there are labels. Okay, and I I should say that this is the point where my my almost nine-year-old has just appeared in the kitchen where I am. So he's going to now hear me talk about fuck. Thank you very much. But okay. you know, this is how it has to happen. All right. <laughs> okay. Can I just point out that he's laughing? And so he's heard you <laughs> talk about fuck before. Or you know, somebody. There, there, are no, there, are no, there are no really truly bad words. The slurs are the worst words, right? But in our family, we talk a lot about words. We are not afraid of, and you, you can't, you, you, if you're, if you're, my my husband's a poet and I'm a lexicographer. Like we're not we're not afraid of words. Oh my um, god, your poor kid. <laughs> <laughs> now, Emily, we read in the New Yorker that one of your career highlights was discovering a previously unrecorded sense for the indefinite article A. Is that correct? 
That is true, yes. Now this is this is wonderful because in fact, I love the sense that you discovered and you were the first person to discover it even though people had been using it. Do you wanna go on about that a little bit? Wait, what does sense mean? It's one of the word's meanings. We just call them senses. So when you look at an entry and you've got one, one A, one B, we call the, the numbered um, items are senses and then the A, B, C, those are sub senses. It's not a term that, that normal people need to know really. Now, the sense that I was trying to bring up was you discovered the one, and I'll, I'll quote you here, used as a function word before a proper noun to distinguish the condition of the referent from the usual former or hypothetical condition. Or referent, I guess, is the, is the word. That's clear as a bell. Well, Who didn't know that? Well, here's an example. <laughs> When the angels dispatched in short order, a rested shilling could start three times if seven games were necessary against the Yankees. That's right. The word uh there tells you that he is not always rested, that right. there has been a change in his condition. That's amazing. So we're saying a rested Kurt Schilling could do better against the Yankees than the usual Kurt Schilling. Or than the previous one, the one who had just been there five minutes earlier. Yes. Right. Uh -oh. So it's about that change. Well, that's five minutes is not a lot of time for a pitcher to rest, Emily. Oh, but I, I don't really want to. <laughs> Was he the one that tried to run for president? Um, I think that might be the guy. He's not a nice guy. Huh. So how did you come across that, Emily? I guess that's my real question. Well, in the course of our work, when we are, that was for the 11th Collegiate Dictionary. And when we are working on um, those dictionaries, we are doing updates to the dictionaries, we are examining every entry in the entire dictionary and we are looking at the evidence that we have collected for each particular word. And um, part of each editor's job is to collect evidence of words in use from whatever we're reading. And we're reading books and magazines or you know, like restaurant menus. You can just like take a picture of a restaurant menu and get it into the files if you see an interesting usage. So I had, um, this was back again when I was still really new. That dictionary was published in 2003. And I had, um, we never start at A in the dictionary. We always start later and then we go back to A. Okay. Um, and so I happened to sign out that section of the dictionary, which was, you know, maybe, I don't know, A to Abacus or something. And so I had all these little slips of paper, three by five slips of paper. We no longer do this on paper anymore. We now use our electronic database. And these were already in the database. We were still doing it on paper. The whole project was on paper. Okay. So I had all these three by five slips of paper for the entry for a, uh, or for all the different uses of a. Uh, and I was kind of sorting them on my desk and saying, okay, this one is covered by this part of the definition. This is covered by this part of the definition. And I ended up with a few slips for this use that I was very familiar with that was really not actually covered by any of the definitions. So I had to write one. Fantastic. Well, a nation full of sportscasters thanks you for that because they use that all <laughs> the time. So you've had, you know, that was the highlight of, of your career, or, or one, of the, one of the highlights. <laughs> Being on this show when the word brain rection was first created uh, probably was exciting. It's huge. It's really, it's really <laughs> powerful yeah. stuff. Well, well, we're we're proud too. Probably not as impressed as you are because like that kind of stuff comes from us all the time. But um, <laughs> it is a moment of history for sure. <laughs> I should clearly just hang out with you more often so I can witness the birth of these, <laughs> these fabulous words. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you have a favorite word? I do. I have, well, yeah, well <laughs> yes and no. I, the, the favorite words kind of come and go. There are words that I'm really, really keen for for a period of time. I, I'm really partial to Scottish, words of Scottish English, the Scottish dialect. And uh, I was just doing some research on them quite recently. So these are words that are kind of in still still in my mind from recent research, the word wow, W-O-W-F, means wild or crazed. Oh, like wow. Kids, we're all wow right now in our cabin fever. And another one that also feels like it's just a very useful word right now is peenge, which means to complain or grumble, P-E-E-N-G-E. -E -E. And that's Scottish too. Yes, that's also Scottish English. Also, uh, plaid. Plaid. Scottish. Well, that's a, a good word. A, you mean like a tartan? Yeah, like a Scottish thing. And uh, I'm sure, Emily, <laughs> that you very much enjoy the word Lorna Doom. 
<laughs> it's a cookie. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Well, I like peenge. It sounds dirty. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you are you trying to bring up that 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 brain rection word again? Brain no, brain rection. I feel like that's already entered the lexicon. That's a popular <laughs> classic already. But I think there might be an alternate definition of peenge, which is like a special kind of pajama that you wear exclusively on your genitals. <laughs> oh boy. Well, you know, I mean, you, if you if you want to do that, you can do it. Just, just you know, good luck because getting a <laughs> meaning like that to really become established is gonna is gonna. That's a hard job right there. Emily, do you ever get pissed at a word and take it out? No, no, but uh, no, no. Uh huh. Yeah, I can tell. There's a little defensiveness in the way you. Said yeah, that. we're getting to the part of the interview where, you, where you're just gonna grill them, right, Paula? <laughs> I don't think Emily deserves this kind of treatment. <laughs> well, there's like, I mean, the words in some ways they're they would go against really the the, the oath of a lexicographer. Yeah. To just remove a word because you're angry at it. It's like you know, I I, I don't love the word chillax, and I've, I've I've actually become more accustomed to it. But there was a time when I thought this is a stupid word. Why does this word belong in the dictionary? But there it is. It like stuck around. It qualified for entry, and now chillax is in the dictionary, and it has been now for a long what time. Is chillax? I relax. kind of agree it's with a you. blending of chill and relax. I thought it was stupid at first. And there are lots of blend words that come along or portmanteaus, mm -hmm. people like to call them, that I think like, ah, oh, that's kind of a dumb word. But you know what? I don't know. They're words. Like smog. I'm kind of with really you on dumb. chillax because to my mind, chillax combines two words that already kind of mean the same thing. It's mm -hmm. a tautology in one word. Thank <laughs> you, Paula. I, I agree with you, Emily. I don't like chillax. And when I think... The brain rection isn't even in the dictionary and shellax gets to be in there. It just steams me. Yeah, it ain't right. It just ain't right. Um, well, thank you, Emily Brewster, for helping define for us how dictionaries work. And now we're going to take that information and run it through the old pounstinator, which is a word that does, belongs in your dictionary as well. Paula? Harry, if I can get a little background music, I'll tell you what my takeaways are. Perfect. This was so fascinating. I would love to do this job. There are only about 50 lexicographers in the country and they know each other. Emily says there is a collegial feeling among the rival dictionaries. They even have a softball league and the smack talk is practically unintelligible to any outsiders. You rimsibiblius! Use your layer at the back of your eyeball containing cells that are sensitive to light and from which impulses are sent to the brain. I was safe. In what sense? Based on good reason or evidence and not likely to be wrong? No, protected from danger or risk. I'll knock you into that bunch of lepidus fitagengi. Fuck you, fuck you, obsoboticans. <laughs> Emily Brewster is the senior editor of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Thank you for being on our show, Emily. We love you. You were great, Emily. Thanks so much. We'll be back with more Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone after this. It comes as no surprise that we're all stuck in our homes for a while. Avoid the complacency. It's important now more than ever to stay active and keep moving. Work out and even take classes in the comfort of your own home with Beachbody On Demand. Beachbody On Demand is the easy to use streaming service that gives you instant access to over 1,300 super effective workouts suited for anybody at any time. The secret to getting results is getting started. Oh man, that's the hard part. They have the best programs. Hundreds of effective workouts for all fitness levels, ranging from bodybuilding to weight training to cardio hit to yoga and even dance workouts. Picture wow. that, if you will. Work out on your schedule. Workouts are as short as 10 minutes that don't require extra equipment. And the time it takes you to drive and park at the gym, you can be finished working out. I love Whoa. that. Access anywhere and anytime. View on your computer, web-enabled TV, tablet, smartphone, Roku, Apple TV, Chromecast, and and Abacus. Uh, your wallet. You can you can do it from your wallet. You, you can't you, do it from your wallet. You can use a can opener. You you can use a if you have a thimble at home. If you have a thimble, you can get. It's not a thimble based. It's the workout. best. 
It is a thimble-based workout. It's the best deal in fitness. Listeners of Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone can try it absolutely free. Whoa. Oh, I, I'm all about the workout in my living room. All right. Um, you know, the, the uh, Morning Meltdown 100, you commit to 100 days of working out. And the best part is they don't come and check. Uh, they're very, they, they are very, there's beginners and, and there's a whole range of levels. You can modify the really hard ones. Cause some of that jumping around stuff. Oh my gosh. Um, the rats under my house have actually knocked on my front door and said, what the fuck? Yeah. Um, that'll happen. Yeah. I really want you to try this service though, because you know what? Now is the time to keep your emotional well being with rigorous working out. And I know for a fact that it makes you feel better to be active, even though it feels lousy to even think about it. But right now, my listeners can get a special free trial membership when you text Paula to 303030. That's 303030. You will get full access to this entire platform for free. All the workouts, the nutrition information and support, totally free. Again, just text Paula to 303030. Hey, I'm Andy. If you don't know me, it's probably because I'm not famous. But I did start a men's grooming company called Harry's. The idea for Harry's came out of a frustrating experience I had buying razor blades. Most brands were overpriced, overdesigned, and out of touch. At Harry's, our approach is simple. Here's our secret. We make sharp, durable blades and sell them at honest prices for as low as $2 each. We care about quality so much that we do some crazy things, like buy a world-class German blade factory. Obsessing over every detail means we're confident in offering a 100% quality guarantee. Millions of guys have already made the switch to Harry's, so thank you if you're one of them. And if you're not, we hope you give us a try with this special offer. Get a Harry starter set with a five-blade razor, weighted handle, shave gel, and a travel cover. All for just three bucks, plus free shipping. Just go to harrys.com and enter 8989 at checkout. That's harrys.com, code 8989. Enjoy. We're back, and thank you, house band Harry Orlov. Uh, here we hey, go. Adam, <laughs> I, there's another bid. No. I just want to tell you there's another, <laughs> yeah, there's another bid yes. for the lint ball. Okay. It's uh, Crystal Lee Sutton's lint ball. Um, Jeff Bezos. What? One of the <laughs> Jeff Bezos is bidding uh-huh. on the on the lint ball. What is what he uh, According to Bloomberg Billionaires Index, Jeff Bezos is the only one of the world's five richest people that hasn't lost money. Yeah. Uh, uh over over all of this. Uh he has bid $2,500. Uh, thank you Jeff Bezos. Okay. I, I guess um, I, I want to say, however, that um, this is the second consecutive auction where it feels like our billionaires are lowballing us. Warren Buffett was toying with a listener just two weeks ago. Well, uh, maybe that's part of they got rich in two ways. Uh, in the case of Jeff Bezos, off the backs of workers. Right. Uh, I suppose in some ways the same for Warren Buffett. Um, wow, that's Warren really Buffett not going to make them friendly to your auction if you're going to slag them like that. Well, I mean, my point being that they are also, I guess, wise with money. And and so, you know, they're not just tossing it around, but this is not just any lint ball. Uh, This is a very important lint ball. It belonged to Crystal Lee Sutton, who was the inspiration for the the movie Norma Ray that a lot of people uh, remember. I got it. Yes, indeed. Uh, Love lift us up where he belongs. Very excited. Yes, I Oh, my God. Wait a minute. What? Wait a minute. What? Scott Franciscus. Thank you, Scott, <laughs> our benefactor. Another bit. Uh, it would be like Scott to to buy the lint ball and just give it right back to me. He is such a generous, generous he's not. man. No, I mean, he's a perfectly uh, he, good he, man, but. He is. He's been our benefactor uh, for quite a while on the podcast, and we thank him so much. He's made a bit of of $2,650 uh, for the big fuzzy ball of lint that once belonged 
Yeah. Uh, to, yeah, uh, Crystal Lee Sutton. Now, was, now, for our listeners who are just dipping into our show for the first time, because let's face it, we're all under quarantine, so we're listening to a lot of new things. Scott Franciscus is a listener to our podcast who was the very first winner of a bar of hotel soap from Paula Poundstone. <laughs> and unfortunately, that bar was awarded to him by our producer, Tony Nita Hull, who sent it in a in an envelope that she tried to just send regular postage, and she stuffed this uh, soap into an envelope. It arrived postage due at Scott Franciscus's place, and he paid that postage. But to our knowledge, that is all he ever paid. No, he's done many things for the show, and I want to thank him so much for this bid okay. of $2,650. All right. Scott Franciscus, you are the man. Thank you. You are and the I man. I mean that in the best of ways. Absolutely. You know, Crystal Lee Sutton, Adam, was a third-generation textile mill worker. She started in the factory at 17, and in 1972, she was folding towels at J.P. Stevens in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. Okay. For 200, excuse me, for $2.65 an hour, not 200, $2.65 an hour. That's low. And Eli, Eli Zivkovich from the Textile Workers of America, began helping her. He gave her a book called What the Company Will Do for You. Okay. And it had blank pages. Oh, uh, clever. She began wearing a union pin on the work floor. She began wearing a union pin, which the man didn't like. So the bosses would call her into the office for every little infraction. Right. And she began taking notes on what they were doing in her blank book. Okay. Which she later said blew the boss men's mind. Wow. Now, how did her dad, yeah. the coal miner, feel about this? <laughs> how did her dad, the coal miner, feel about this? I believe yeah. her parents were both also textile mill workers. She was third generation. Really? Textile mill. All the, so yes, she's, although, she's not the coal miner's daughter. No, she is not the coal miner's daughter. And nor, Adam, was she in Saturday Night Fever. Well, I knew that, Paula. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> yeah. You, you, just, <laughs> you seem to be confusing a lot of early films yeah. with Norma Ray. Well, late 70s yeah. movies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She wasn't in any of those. But she did um, go on fact, to become uh, Marilyn Monroe. She did not. Eli Zivkovich was a West Virginia uh, coal miner, in fact. The guy that was from the uh, Textile Workers of America that was a union organizer that helped her. He was okay. uh, had at one time. So his daughter became a country star. Uh, Adam, answer the phone. What? <laughs> answer the phone. <laughs> All right. Hello? Yeah, yeah, Adam, hey, man, this is Mike Bullman Bonavich. Hey, Mike. Uh, yeah, man, what the fuck is she talking about? Goddamn lip ball from who the fuck? What, is, what the fuck is she talking about? What do you mean? She, is she talk, she, she's talking about the woman from Finding Nemo. What the fuck is she talking about? The woman from Finding Nemo? <laughs> yeah, the fish, the girl fish that, there that, without the memory. You know what I Ellen mean. That's Ellen DeGeneres. Yeah. Yeah, she didn't work in a factory. I don't know how you put up with this girl. You know what, what you, I mean? What do you mean, Mike? Like what? I, you know, I, I just don't know how you put up with her. Right. She doesn't know shit about anything. Am I the hundredth caller? You are not. You are caller number fifty-three, as far as I can tell. Oh, but you and I are gonna hang out after the game, anyways, right? I devoutly hope not, Mike. <laughs> oh, oh man, because I love you. I love hanging out with you. You and me. Uh, yeah. We are like. Bonnie and Clyde. And what? You and me, we're like Siskel and Ebert or something. How we're are like, we like Siskel and Ebert? We're close, you know, because we're both, because I give you the thumbs up and you give me the thumbs up. That's you know not even I mean? how Siskel and Ebert worked, Mike. They gave thumbs up, Adam. Not to each other. Oh, well, yeah, we're, we're like them, but we carve our own path. That's what I like about us. <laughs> That's what I like about it. Okay, okay. We're like Siskel and Ebert, right. but we're not like Siskel and Ebert. You know what I mean? Like, for example, right. I think they're dead, and we're not. And that's a way that we're not like them. But okay. we are cool. Yeah. All right, look at man. I'm going to call you back. I'm going to call you back. I, I really you don't be have to. Call. Okay. All right, good talking to me. Good talking to I wish I could say the same. Um. So, Paula. Yeah, high get... five, man. High five. Down low. No. Up high. No, neither. <laughs> okay. 
Hey, uh, Paula. Can you hear the pod puppy scratching the floor? No. <laughs> He's having a time behind me. She. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. All right. Well, now, Paula. Hey, Mo. Yeah. Stop. Okay, wait. You know what? What? I, we just got another bid. Another bid. <laughs> oh, my God. This is from Brian Martin, who's a friend of mine. He's a fantastic promoter uh, that I've worked with a number of times. He was promoting a show for me at the end of April at Town Hall in New York City, and it was almost sold out. Wow. Uh, for, uh, before the virus became a show critic. Uh, I, I, I can't even believe he has any money now, but he has bid $3,000 for the lint ball from Crystal Lee Sutton. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and by the way, the, the New York City Town Hall Paula Poundstone show has been moved to July 31st. Uh, uh, so, but thank you very much, Brian. Uh, you know, for those of you still not really sure who Crystal Lee Sutton is, let me just tell you this, and this should improve the, uh, She's the one who worked with Dolly Parton and Jane Fonda to bring down that bad boss. No, that was, uh, Lily Tomlin. Uh, okay. no. When the factory boss- It's a very similar, very similar story. No, quite different. When the factory bosses <laughs> posted an anti-union letter on the wall stirring racial mistrust by claiming the union would be run by black workers, Crystal oh. Lee Sutton began copying the letter down on a piece of paper. The bosses told her to stop, so she slipped the paper into her bra and they fired her instantly. She then went back to her workstation to gather her things and asked a friend for a marker. She grabbed a piece of wasteboard and wrote the word union in big letters, climbed up on a table and held the sign up for all the workers to see. And the workers began to shut the machines down until the factory sat silent and workers held their fingers up in a V to show their solidarity. At which point the boss called the police and they arrived, arrested, and then carried courageous fighting linthead Crystal Lee Sutton kicking and screaming from the factory. That is the person who owned this lint ball, ladies and gentlemen. That's wait, who so, that is. Wait, so it wasn't Richard Gere who carried her out? No, absolutely not. Wait a minute. That's why we just got another bid, another uh, Jeff Bezos. Why Jeff Bezos <laughs> wants a symbol of worker solidarity? Unless it's just to vacuum it up, I have no idea. But he has made six, Jeff, Jeff Bezos has made $6 billion in the last three months. <laughs> The guy is so full of money right now. Amazon pays very small percentage in taxes, so he can afford this $4,000 that he just uh, bid. I guess, thank you, Jeff Bezos, I guess. Okay. Uh, I, we've auctioned off some really cool stuff, but this right. is really, I mean, those bids just keep keep coming in. It's fantastic. Yeah, this, thank this you. Lint, this lint ball is really <laughs> activating our our listeners, yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised. I knew when I got it that it was very, very, very special. Adam, answer the phone. Really? Yeah. Answer the phone. Hello. Uh, Adam. Yes. Adam. Adam. Uh, am I the hundredth caller? You are not. Your caller number fifty. I'm going to go with four. Oh, Tony Anita Hall is, is is she caller number fifty four or fifty three? Fifty four. Fifty four. Welcome. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Adam. <laughs> Adam. Adam. Yes. It is I. It is I, Cher, Eva. I know, I, Cher. Welcome. I. You're at home. We're all at home, Cher, Eva. That's, <laughs> that's not psychic. That's I not psychic. It. That's where we all are. I knew it. No, I did. And wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This, uh, are you, you have been using... Recipebox.com. Yes. How would you I know that, it. Cher? I knew it. I knew it's it. Actually, you know, Adam, it's actually not recipebox.com. It's an app called Recipe Box, and I've been talking about it on my Twitter feed. Adam, you were born to a woman. Am I... Am I... <laughs> Uh, you know Is what? That... I would I would love to confirm that share, but I was too young to remember it. Yeah, and you know, I I have been giving you such fantastic readings uh, out of yes. for free. 
And you uh, yeah. Long, long, long. This is freely available information, <laughs> Cher Long Eva. Island. You lived on Long Island. Yes. yes. I knew it. I knew it. No, no, I no, Cher Eva. There is a difference between using your psychic powers and using Google, and I suspect you of using the latter. Uh, no, I don't use Google. Adam, uh, I'd like. I'd like you to sponsor me. I, I've given you some Wait, great what? meetings. <laughs> I, I'd like you to uh, talk about my the work that I have done for you and and the peace of mind that I have brought you uh, and the understanding. And I've told you a lot about what you can expect. Are from you life. asking me to advertise for you on my podcast? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just straight up no. I knew it. I knew it. You know, Adam, it's my pet reading that I'm really proud of. Yes. Your dog right now. Your yes. dog uh l l l l Luna, I've told you her name. Yes, I knew it. I knew it. Um your dog is uh inside? <laughs> I don't <laughs> I, I I honestly don't know. Probably I, your not. Dog, your dog is inside. Do you see what I'm saying? You didn't know where your dog was, and I was able to tell you. See, this is just one of the ways that I have served you, and that was. I, I am How does so that happy serve me? I'm so How happy. How does that serve me at service. all? You know, if I could just have for my website, if I could just have this audio clip. Of me doing Here, that you know what? You know what, Cher training? Eva? Cher Eva, I will give you yeah. a quote for your website. Do you want a quote for your website? <laughs> no, I want that. I want, here you go. I don't. I don't. I don't. No, no, I here you go. I'm going to give you one. Here it comes. Get ready. If you have a recording device recorded, here we go. Here's Adam Felber saying, Cher Eva, she can tell you whether your pet is inside or not. <laughs> There you go. Enjoy. Adam. Yes. Luna is crying out right now. <laughs> she's not crying out. And no, you're no, not she's not. It. Adam, has Luna been scratching her left ear? No. <laughs> when she scratches her left ear, Adam, it's because she wants you to sponsor me. Mm. Okay. Well, that's good to know. All right. I, I'm going to call back, Adam, because I'm hoping to be the 100th caller. All right. Well, thank you, Sure Eva. Uh, Paula. I knew it. I knew it. No, Sure Eva, I, hang up. Hang up. <laughs> hang up, Sure Eva, for God's sakes. Adam, are you still there? Yes. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> All right, Adam. Yes. I'm going to hang up now. Adam. Paula. Adam, are you still there? Is it still Sure Eva? I knew it. I knew it. All right, I'm just, hanging up. Just hang up the phone. Or I'm not bye. sponsoring you. Okay, bye. Oh, my God. Paula, did Boy, you she hear that? Adam, she really wants you to sponsor her, man. And she knew all about... That was uncanny what she knew about your life and your dog. <laughs> was it? Yeah. I got to say something. I was over there one night, and your dog was scratching her left ear. I just saw my notice. <laughs> That means Luna really wants you to sponsor, because that's what it I, means. Uh, you know, speaking of hotel soap, producer Tony Nita Hull still has an assortment of Kit Kat bars from Japan. Now, Paula, to remind She's you. She's living off those during the crisis. Right. The, now, the purveyors of these bars, the importers, omgjapan.com, paid us $1,000 and sent us all these interestingly flavored Kit Kat bars from Japan. How many, Remember that? How many? How many different flavors do they do they offer? They they that? offer twenty five different flavors. Wow! But uh, and we were doing taste tests with them, and talking about them on our show. We didn't love them a lot, but somehow when the music stopped and everybody had to sit in their chairs, <laughs> Tony Anita Hall ended up with all of the Kit Kats. Yeah, that's not. A surprise to me. She's a wily coyote, that one. No, she's she wily. Been... So, 
She had been yes. saying to me from the very start, she said, you know, I wish there was a way I could keep these Kit Kats. And I said to her, I said, Tony, you know, these are really for all of us and it's part of the show and they sent them so we could taste test them. And then she said, no, I wish there was a way that everyone would have to stay in their house and there was no way for us to get to the studio and I could right. have the bags. And, and then she said, if I'm not mistaken, then she said, as long as I'm importing Kit Kats from Japan, maybe I should import some virus too. Yeah, it was something like that. Something, yeah, something like, like that. that. She said. Yeah. I said, I said, I said, Tony, what to what level will you sink to get these Kit Kat bars? <laughs> My gosh. Well, no, I think we've she learned. She didn't need to. She didn't need to import anything uh, in terms of virus from Japan. She's that still we know of. On, she's still planning on going <laughs> on a cruise in December. I knew you were yeah. going to say that. You know and what, Tony? Are you still planning on going on that cruise? It, the no. cruise is still on. It's still on, as far as I know. <laughs> you know, you know why it's so cheap, Tony? Because <laughs> she said that, that the price. Because all it is is a petri dish with a big sail in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's a petri dish with live entertainment. Not every petri dish has that. Yeah, it's gonna be great. You get. Anyway, you gotta given, love it. <laughs> given that Tony has our entire supply of Kit Kats, um, we decided that we're going to continue with our taste test. But Tony is going to have to open one, <laughs> let us know what it tastes like, and then you and I will decide whether or not people should buy that. I'll do my best. Tony, what do you have for us? Um, I would just like to say there were not as many Kit Kats as you think there were because Captain Crinkle spent a lot of time opening them tasting it and spitting it out because she hated it <laughs> so, really? oh my god tell me tell me we didn't that might not be true yeah that tell is... me we didn't tell me the virus didn't race around our studio because of that <laughs> she did wait she just sat there opening kit kats she, giving them yes. a nibble and throwing them down yes no she, she would did. open it lick it say ew and then wrap it back up again no, and put it in the I bowl i didn't lick it i didn't lick it i <laughs> Took like one little piece off and tasted that. <laughs> See, and then wait a minute, don't you need a hole? Don't you eat that? Oh don't, dear God! Don't don't you eat that? Body burns, licked it, and put it back in the package. Don't you eat it? <laughs> and she doesn't have the virus, but she's had a terrible cold for weeks now. Don't don't. Well, you as eat if things that? couldn't get don't more chaotic, it's our. Our favorite denuded hand puppet, um, the wonderful everybody, Mrs. Culpepper is here. Let's hear from oh, Mrs. Hello, Culpepper. Oh, hello, Adam Felma. It's so, it's so good to hear your voice. I wish I could see Tony and Nita Ho right now. I would snatch that candy out of her hand so fast and like a lightning bug. Tony, don't <laughs> eat that uh, on the unhealthy candy it's been uh, uh, contaminated by, by Captain Crinkle. <laughs> I do not doubt that you are correct, uh, Mrs. Culpepper. And welcome to the show. How are you holding up during the crisis? Well, it's been difficult because I'm here with Paula Poundstone and she has all these animals and her, her, her dog, the, the big one, uh, Sirius, has been chewing on a plastic bone over, over in the corner of the room so <laughs> noisily I can hardly think. Well, that's uh, you but know I, what I you wanted... you might be better off to shelter in your own home with your husband, Mrs. Culpepper. Oh, well, I'm unable to do that at this time, Madam Felma. As I have... do, you, do you need cab fare or something? Oh no, it's not that, Adam uh, Felma. Uh, my my husband, the captain, uh, the the cap Captain Culpepper, uh, is no longer with us. Oh, I'm so sorry. He didn't die of anything untoward, did he? Well, in fact, he did. Like maybe triotoxism garnered from Gouda cheese? It was tyrotoxism, uh, uh, Adam. Uh, it was, from Gouda. Yes, it was the Gouda. How, how did you know? <laughs> well, what do you, I don't know. It's just a lucky guess. Um, oh, my been, gosh. Or an unlucky you, guess. You, you must have been spending some time with Cher Eva. How you figured yeah. that out? <laughs> it's oh, amazing. It was so, so clever. So nobody knows as much about food contamination as you do, Mrs. Culpepper. I am rather an expert on food contamination and, and personal loss. <laughs> Which is why I don't want to, Tony and Anita Hall, don't you? I'll tell you something. 
when business picks up again and 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 uh, Bonnie Burns goes back to her business of uh, owning that candy shop, Bonnie's Candy Corner, it's gonna <laughs> fail. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, kids that's a don't risk buy of... the grab bag. Don't do it. Tony, will you describe what you're about to eat and we'll try to guess the flavor? Okay. Okay. Um, I will say it does kind of smell like dirt to start with. Okay. Like dirt? Um, dirt. I know what okay. it is. Go ahead, Paul. Dirt? Yeah. It's, um, it's Scott's springtime soil mixture and, and Lipton tea. <laughs> That's actually probably soil and tea. Tony, yeah. is Paula correct with soil and tea? Um, uh, you're close, but it's not quite there. Well, taste Let it me, now. Tell us what I'm you taste. taste it. Sorry, I'm chewing. <laughs> okay. I taste like tea. Like cheese. Like tea. 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 Um, a drink with jam and bread. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It tastes like tea that sat in the cupboard too long. Okay. I didn't even, I didn't even know that could happen. <laughs> and what color was it? It's brown. Okay. Like a, a light brown. The packaging's brown as well. And is there any other flavor note, top note coming to you, or is it just like dirt and tea? <laughs> um, just like old. Is that a flea? Okay, okay. Pa Paula, you want to guess I on this change, one? I want to change my, uh, uh, okay, I think it's Armstrong's Spring Soil Mix and Celestial Seasonings Tea. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to go with matcha. Okay, so are you guys Matcha ready? tea. Yep, matcha, ready. Matcha, matcha, man. Um, Hochicha. Uh, what? Which is a hochicha, which is roasted green tea that's blended into white chocolate and kneaded into the biscuits. Okay, hochicha. and how do you like it? it I, I, I would not recommend it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, Tony, spit it out into the package, twist it closed again, staple it, and mail it to Bonnie. <laughs> All right, we want to hear from all you nobodies. Please email us at nobody listens to Paula Boundstone at gmail.com. And speaking of hotel soap, Paula, you're not going to be on the road. So I guess the part of the job that you really hate promoting yourself isn't happening. My store is still open. That's true. It's right there at paulapoundstone.com and my Butterfinger single, not my Butterfinger, and the ringtone, thank you, Bonnie Burns, are now available for download. <laughs> On my new website, which is up, uh, paulapoundstone.com, as it well is. as the Pussy Pillows and my Remarkably Soft Tri Poly Blend t-shirt with a self-portrait on the left breast and a memorable quote on the back. You can find those there, too. And also, uh, if you go to my website or you go to the uh, Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone uh, Facebook page, I believe you can also find some comedy videos to help get you through the difficult yeah, times your, that we are Your facing. friend Miss Nancy has been a great teacher during these times. Well, thank you very much. Miss Nancy has been doing homeschooling of her Fairbanks yeah, Elementary yeah. School. Very first helpful. Grade class. You can find that on the website, sure. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's an aid for the parents and for the children. And and once again for all our listeners, if you resent that your poundstone pussy pillow only comes with a memorable quote on one side and a signature on the other side and doesn't come with a string for the grommet, you can always retrofit them through my website and your Poundstone's Pussy Pillows will become the much less offensively named Felber's Feline Fun Bags. Absolute calumny. Um, I don't that is not true. Not a word of that is true. Oh no, what? you, you. It's inimical of you. It's inimical. That's what it, it is. is. Oh, Mrs. Culpepper, to hear you using such language is a disappointment to me. We'll be back it's with more. Nobody listens to Paula Bounce. Stuff. That's what it is. What? It's vituperative. It's vituperative? Um, <laughs> it is. Yes. Uh, Adam, um, you know, I wanted to say that the uh, Poundstone Pussy Pillows are somewhat like what Adam described. Um, it's a little pillow about three inches by two inches, maybe, uh, filled with 
fresh uh, catnip and with a cat joke on one side that's printed and then on the other side I'm happy to autograph it um, to your cat and you can find those at the store at paulapoundstone.com and there's a, a place on the form where you would fill out your cat's name and uh, and we'll take it from there. We'll be back with more Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone after this. Fun fact, it can take a photon 40,000 years to travel from the core of the sun to the surface, but only eight minutes to travel the rest of the way to Earth. The reason for this is a phenomenon that scientists refer to as traffic. And we're back. So, Paula, the auction is closing, is it not? Did anyone else bid? It is. That's exactly right. The auction closes, as you know, Adam, at the end of our show. And I'm waiting. I I, I, I don't see Three, any other... Two, I hate, I one. Hate the, I hate it to go. Hey, wait a minute. What? Oh, my God. Scott Franciscus, the nobody listens to Paula Poundstone beloved benefactor, has claimed Jeff Bezos's clock with a blow on behalf of workers everywhere. With a winning bid for the giant lint ball once owned by union hero Crystal Lee Sutton of $6,000. Thank you, Scott Franciscus, if for nothing else, not letting Jeff Bezos have it. What a great guy. What a fine supporter of our, our show. And I know, Scott, you're going to be proud to have that lint ball there in your house uh, <laughs> that once belonged to Crystal Lee Sutton. It's not just any lint ball. It belonged to Crystal Lee Sutton, hero of the union in... Uh... And, and, and you know what? I mean, I believe she put it best when she said that she worked nine to five. And what a way to make a living. No, that wasn't Crystal Lee Sutton. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm almost certain that was. No. She was barely getting by. It was all taking and no giving, Paula, for her. She she said no, it best. That, um, no, she said it better thinking, than I ever could. You're thinking of Dolly Parton uh, from 9 to 5, Adam. That was not Crystal Lee Sutton. Agree to disagree. I, there's no point stickling <laughs> over it, but at the same time, I'm correct and, and you're incorrect. Uh, all right. Well, whatever. That's our show, everybody. Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone is hosted by Paula Poundstone and yours truly, Adam DeFelber. Produced by Paula Poundstone, Adam Felber, Bonnie Burns, Ken Lezebnik, and Tony Anita Ho. Mixing by Michael Hoagie. Special thanks to tonight's house band, Harry Orlov. Fantastic. Harry, thank you. Harry, thanks for stepping up. And thanks to our guest, the amazing Emily Brewster. Starburns production by Land Romo. Technical direction by Jessica Gutierrez. Transcription services for the show provided by Transcribe Me, a premier internationally used transcription service. Use code Paula Poundstone when placing your order at transcribeme.com to receive an expedited service. That's our show for tonight. Won't somebody please listen to me? A lint ball. Yeah, it's not just any lint ball. It's you 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 feel how would you a know? Sense of I do know. I feel a sense of history when I touch this lint ball. It's really beautiful. I wish you could see it. I can't. I'm home. Yeah, I, I know. Sher Sherry Eva told me. No, I told you. No, Sherry Eva told me first. She She's remarkable. I mean, We're what she all has home. Been, what she has been able to do in terms of reading you is bloody amazing. I'm not. You should sponsor her. I'm not really sponsoring her. No. You know, like wear T-shirts no. no. that advertise her and no. give out her Absolutely business not. cards, and not maybe gonna. some window paints. You could no. use window paints on your Absolutely front no. window. Absolutely not. Not going to. Sh Sher Eva said, "I'm in here." Oh uh, yeah, no. Starbands Avenue, a podcast, <clears throat> a podcast network.